So Hannah, we're back. This is part two of our, uh, I would say, open and honest discussion about network marketing and, and where we kind of see it moving into the future and maybe some issues or I would say bottlenecks that are involved in that industry that a lot of people maybe aren't talking about. So I wanted to lead off with this question and, you know, we talked about it in, in the first discussion about it, it does take the right person to succeed in network marketing. And there are multiple facets and personality traits, personality types, quality traits, business skills that require success in this industry. My, my big question is this, because you hear two different perspectives. It's the multi-passionate entrepreneur mindset and the solo entrepreneur mindset. And what I mean by that is this. Sometimes network marketing is, is posed to people as not so much a way out, but as a, a revenue stream to do other things. Meaning, you know, use this money for whatever you want to use it for, you know, pay some bills, pay some debt, you know, start another business, you know, use it as, as a means and an avenue to do more. So it's posed as that. But then there's the, I would say, the conflicting other side of it where there's all these, not even hidden, but terms and conditions when you sign up with a network marketing company that they have the right to terminate a position based on anything that they feel outside of what the independent contractor should be doing to represent their company uh, as a means of maybe cross recruiting or bad business tactics where almost like you're pigeonholed where you can't do anything outside of it, even though, you know, you'll go to a convention and I remember going to one and that's how they were posing it. Like you use this money to fund and do bigger and better things if that's what you want to do. But <laughs> months later, my account was frozen. So what's your thoughts and feelings on how it actually should work with that person that joins network marketing, should they be able to do multiple opportunities or is it safer to put all their eggs in one basket? I think what you're talking about comes down to the way, and that for me, the problematic way that MLMs are structured, because it's kind of like you have the worst of everything as a, as a consultant. You don't get a salary. You don't get any rights. Like you would have like some maternity leave, holiday pay, sick pay, these obviously vary from country, country, state to state, but there are legal rights you have as an employee. You have the protection of the company. Um, so you are a, an independent contractor. So you have no salary. You don't have any of those rights. Um, but then also the company um, has all the advantage because on the one hand, they can lay down the law to you and say, you can only work within these rules that we're creating. Um, However, if you do some, if this independent contractor then does something wrong, the companies then go, well, they're nothing to do with us. You know, they're an independent contractor. Um, I see, I mean, I've seen a lot of people talk about, you mentioned your account being frozen. I have heard of people who have genuinely tried to play by the rules and, 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 and build an honest business within the MLM company they work with or for. Um, only to find that that has been taken away. Um, and I do find that, and again, this is to me, one of the problems of, of network marketing, multiple MLM is, um, and again, down to the, this kind of way it's structured, you are recruited genuine, generally by a person. You're recruited by maybe a friend, an acquaintance, a colleague, or a complete stranger. And they are presenting the opportunity to you. Um, and they really need you to join because you joining their downline will um, grow their, their kind of income. Um, potentially, it will give them the numbers they need in their downline to, to kind of maybe go up or, or stay where they are in the plan. So they really need you to join. They are highly incentivized for you to join. They might actually know that actually when you do join, you're probably not going to make much money. Maybe they haven't made much money. Maybe they've lost money, but they really need you to join to try and maybe turn their fortunes around. So they're incentivized to um, really get you on board. And this is where you have the problems is they might tell you 
not necessarily the truth. You know, I've heard people go, you can build it in pockets of time around your children, around this. And then people will join and they're told, oh, no, if you want to make it work, you've got to work 24 hours a day. This is a common complaint I get from people. Um, so I think there's there's a few issues here for me and how in a whole way this business is structured in, in the fact that these companies um, take on people as independent contractors. They're not, they're not, on the one hand, they're not bound by the rules of the company, but they are, because you say, well, when you look at the TNCs, they can terminate you for lots of different reasons. So I think it just makes it very, very difficult for people. It's almost like the rules of the game are, are sometimes hidden from you. And, and, and the reality is for most people, so you are perhaps, you know, in like my audience's case, maybe you're a mum and you're looking for a bit of income on the side. It might be that you want to give up your job and work full time doing this, or you just simply want some money to pay for holidays because, you know, or cash is tight. And someone tells you to join and they tell you it's really easy. You just sign up here. And then so you agree, as we all do, you know, we all buy things and we agree to the terms and conditions. How many of us, you know, if we sign up to software, actually read the terms and conditions on things? You know, we accept that they're going to be general legal stuff fair because this is a good company and we just we just say yes yeah. so a lot of people join these companies without reading the small print um and then it's a small print that some kind sometimes come back and bite them so the, the other thing that this this kind of makes me think about is the adage that you hear this saying all the time the only way to fail is to quit so you you hear this, and, and this was said to me, like, Scott, keep going, right? You know, it may not happen this year. It may not happen next year. It may not happen in year 10 or year 12 or year 15. But if you quit, you'll never find out when it does happen. So it it's this, I don't want to say brainwashing, but it's this seed that's planted in people's heads that they almost feel guilty hmm. to quit, even though intuitively in their hearts because again the mind and the heart are two different things right mm. so you know when we go with our gut instincts right our, our gut and our heart are are really saying to us you know what i don't i don't know if this is for me i don't think this is going to work but then the head part of you replays that message well if i if i quit then i automatically fail so there are so many people that stay in too long like longer than they should. And then they have some aha moment, maybe after year six or year seven, and they pivot into something else. They're like, you know what? Maybe I should start selling some real estate because that's that can be more lucrative. Maybe I should start my own business. Maybe I should go back and get a regular steady job where I have benefits, I have insurance. Because these are, again, you and I talked about this in the first discussion, that when you go to the corporate events, they don't teach you about, you know, what insurance plans to get, you know, um, starting your own 401k or IRA to start saving some money, planning out your quarterly taxes. Uh, what business type should you have? An S corp, an LLC, a corporation, um, and, you know, in corporate, whatever it is, right? So th there are, you know, this business in the box theory, there's, there, there are some missing things to that. But what is your thought on that seed that's planted where, you know, there's almost like this guilt that people have about quitting, like they're letting people down if they stop. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole article looking at the psychology of why people stay even after they lose money. And that is a big one. You know, the only way to, to, to fail is to quit. If let's say you let's say every morning you swim a mile. OK, that's your exercise. You get into the sea, you're halfway through your mile, a shark attacks you. And you think, if I get out of the sea right now, you know, I've quit my failed, I've, I've quit my mile. You know, there are times when you're in an abusive relationship, you know, whatever. There are times when quitting is the right thing to do, when we know that, that the outcome isn't going to maybe be right for us. But quitting is not always a negative thing. Um, it is, however, sold to be a negative thing because, you know, again, we talk, I touched on the structure of network marketing. So if you look at compensation plans in network marketing, your rank and often the, the bonuses you get are based on the number of people in your downline and the number of sales that that downline produces. You know, if you get the car plan, the car plan, if you look at those, is usually based on a re retaining a rank, retaining a number of sales and people under you. So if someone is in, an, in higher up in an MLM, if they've got any form of downline, 
they do not want to lose a downline. They do not want to lose a downline because they will lose, potentially lose money or lose rank if the people leave. So this is what I think why this, this thing comes around. It's like they tell you to stay, I believe, because they need you to stay for their own reasons, not for you. They're not genuinely thinking about it for you. This is, to me, one of the real problems of MLM, how it makes a business a very personal thing. It puts responsibility on the people in the MLM for keeping people in. Let's say that a good friend of yours was one of your downlines. She was a manager or he was a manager under you. And they came to you and said, look, you know, I'm in a really awful marriage. Um, my, my spouse is, is, you know, quite of control, maybe beating me. I want to leave. But if I leave, I have to get a job. Um, and and you're thinking, well, I, as a friend, I should tell them to go because they clearly need to leave this marriage. However, you've got a car plan and you are struggling as it is. If this person leaves, you lose your car plan bonus and you've cut, you, you signed on a lease because, you know, you have to sign a lease to get this car. And so you're in this really bad position where you want to tell your friend or, you know, your acquaintance. Yeah, you should walk away from that. You should get a job. I, I can see it's the right thing for you to do. However, if they do that, you're going to be in debt because, you know, you can't make that payment. So this, for me, is one of the things, one of the, the problems with the way network marketing is structured. And it leads to that. You know, there are times for all of us where, you know, I, I am do believe in sticking at things. You know, I, I do. I'm not someone who gives up. But you say, like, you know, when you said before about how do you know when it is you're going to get to the top? But it's if it is. You know, we talked last time about the right personality. There are some people who will never get to the top. They could work 24 hours a day. They could they could message cold call 100 people a day. They will just never make it to that, that top. And those people should not be encouraged, I believe, to stay in if they're losing money. But we all know that, you know, one of the, the, the things that, that the reasons people join MLM and stay is hope. You know, and, and they see the stories of people who've made a success and often tell you, I was like you, you can be me if you just work it enough. So they have that hope and they maybe are struggling. They may be desperate. They may not have other financial options. They may be in debt and with no idea how they could pay that debt off. And the hope gets them into an MLM and it sometimes keeps them there beyond the point whereby it is financially or emotionally healthy for them to be there. Now, the, the other thing, I, I actually, I saw this the other day in a post, the, the whole pyramid scheme versus pyramid structure argument, right? Because everyone knows that pyramid schemes are illegal, like Enron and those types of things. And then there's the pyramid structure. So the way that a lot of network marketing professionals pose that argument is if you look at any organization, it's structured like a pyramid. You have, you know, the CEO or founder of the company, you have the president, the vice president. I mean, you've heard this adage before, but the way that they spin it is they say, yes, if you look at network marketing, it looks like a pyramid structure, but only in network marketing can someone below you outproduce and earn more than the person above you. So here, here's my problem. And I think we, we talked about this last time, you know, I had close to 5,000 people underneath me. No one made near what I was making, like not even close. Mm. And I had some people that were producers. They, they were doing really great. But when you have the volume of numbers and, and again, is it possible? Absolutely. I would say. So we talked also about the, the actual percentage of a chance of getting to the top of a compensation plan, which we recognized was 0.04%, like literally less than a half a percent or 0.4%, right? Mm -hmm. So when you start, when you acknowledge that, what's the actual percent, percentage chance of someone that you that is above you, what's the percentage chance of you actually outproducing them and outperforming them and out earning them in network marketing and, and, and speak to that whole pyramid scheme versus pyramid structure analogy that you hear a lot in the profession. I do hear this a lot. And it's my simple answer to this is, you know, yes, if you look at any organization, any society, you know, it is pyramid shape, you know, politics, you in America, you have a president, you have senators, you have, you know, it, it, it is like that. But if we look at a business, 
the CEO might get paid hugely. He might or she might have shares. OK, they might have a huge amount more than anyone else, but they, they get paid. The directors get paid. The senior managers get paid. The deputy managers get paid. The workers get paid. You know, everyone in that structure earns money for what they do. If they have expenses incurred, their expenses are covered by the company. Um, if they need, if they have holiday, you know, they, everyone within a business, yes, there's a hierarchical structure, but everyone in that, they, they have their role, they accept that role based on, is the input you want from me, the hours you want me to work and the things you want me to do, is it worth the output, what I'm gonna get from you? Is it worth the salary you're gonna pay me in the benefits? I make a decision, yes or no, and I, and I decide to stay there. Now, ML the MLM structure also looks like a pyramid when you look at, at you know, you've got like one of the, the, let's say a diamond, whatever, and it comes down. And we look at the earnings as well. You know, very few people will get to the top of the earnings table. But the difference between that and a business is no one in an MLM earns a salary. No one in MLM gets holiday pay. No one in America gets any of that. They have none of those protections. Um, and yes, you're right. You are told that in theory, it is, it is correct. I could join an MLM tomorrow and I could outsell the person at the top. But equally, I'm a human being with two legs. I could be the world's fastest runner in theory. In practice, that is never going to happen. And I would say like you with 5,000 people under you, no one outsold you. That is the case. Now, one of the things when we look at um, the definition of what a pyramid scheme is um, one of the things that always comes up, which is key to it, is there a product? You know, is, is there something? And, and generally, is that product sold outside of the pyramid? This is the key thing. Is there a genuine product members of the public buy? So the money is, is, is being made outside the pyramid shape structure. Um, and what we generally, generally find, yes, in, in most, you know, in MLMs, they did do have products, that is true. But we also know, which was, acknowledged in, in, a, in a blog I wrote about someone, you know, an expert who, who um, gives um, talks for the DSA, and he claims that 90% of the effort that, that MLM traditionally have made is selling products to their own people within, within it. Um, and I know that when I have looked at the products and I've priced if benchmark them on price and quality, they are usually much more expensive than something you could buy off the high street. And when I have interviewed people um, who have made it to the top um, in the UK, when I've spoken to people, I've spoken to a few people who've got to the very like black unique presenters, and they've admitted that um, their money came from their downline, that actually quite often they would have to personally purchase to make their their sales requirement to be active, that their money was not made selling products. So, you know, I I personally believe that the way that MLMs are structured and the way that what I just described about the, 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 the way that money is earned, I think when you look at the definition of a pyramid scheme, it's hard to argue that network marketing, most companies are not by that definition, potentially a pyramid scheme. You know, the, the other big thing I, I think you... I wanted to kind of park on is the fact that it's not a job, meaning any time you take off is, is unpaid. If you don't enroll people in a specific week, you're not making money. If people underneath you are not producing, you're not making money. If people quit underneath you, you're not making money. So that, that whole analogy that, you know, could someone underneath you outperform you? Well, it depends on the compensation plan. The compensation plan that I was a part of is called a binary pay plan, meaning it's got two legs. It's you and then two legs that you build and there's unlimited depth. So that it just keeps going down and everything filters back up. It doesn't matter what I do. If people underneath me are producing and, and so on and so on, it still flows all the way back up. So I don't ever have to, as long as I had, I had someone active on one side and the other side, and they could be enrolling all day long. I could literally just kick back and just reap the benefits of what those people did. But they don't talk about that because they, it, it's a, and, I, and and that's not to the fault of the network marketing professionals that are saying that. They truly believe that, but the, the companies have created that statement to create internal motivation within that person's downline because they want to give that person the belief that um you know if you tell your downline this 
it's going to motivate them. It's going to keep them going. But in all reality, if the chances are less than a half a percent of you actually making it to the top of the compensation plan, I would say it's even half of that, if not more uh, of a chance of superseding or exceeding your upline. Because depending upon the compensation, if it's a binary compensation plan, which is the most profitable com compensation plan, you're never going to leap that person because anything that you do is still filtering up through them no matter what. So as we start to, to wind down, Hannah, if you could leave uh, whoever listened to this or watched this, your, your honest uh, and most genuine piece of advice for that person that's listening to this that is, has resonated with everything. They're, they're frustrated. They're, they're struggling. They have been guilted into a lot of this. There, there's been issues with friends and family because of, you know, I don't want to say the brainwashing, but, but, you know, the experience that they've had in network marketing, what is your simple and honest message to that person? So first of all, please don't feel any shame. Like anyone, and I have interviewed people um, and it's been more like a therapy session than an interview. And I've had people telling me that the only secret they have from their partner is the debt they still have on a credit card that they built up. So first of all, it's not you. Um, I believe that this structure is set up for most people to fail. Um, it, people have to fail and I have to lose money, I believe, in order for the people higher up to win. So it's not you. Please don't feel any shame. Um, your friends and family will understand, you know, if you talk to them afterwards. They're probably just worried about you and you may feel like you can't speak to them because maybe that you've told them certain things or you've been, changed your personality by posting things on social media you wouldn't normally post. They will just be glad to have you back normally. Um, Please don't get caught in some cost fallacy. Don't think, oh, like, you know, I've lost this much if I stay on a bit longer. The chances are you might just lose more. Sometimes it's time to walk away. Um, if it's not working for you financially or emotionally, there's no shame in walking away and learning from it and putting it behind you. Um, so please, please don't feel shame. Do ask for help from your friends and family. They they probably, like I say, just worried about you and will be glad to have you back if they feel like you have changed. Um, and please do walk away. If you are on the fence and you're not sure, we spoke last time about just keep a track of the time and money you spend and what you get back and then make a personal decision. Do I feel whether it's financially or emotionally, what I've got back is worth what I spent and then, and then make a decision based on that. But do it with the full kind of frank, honest kind of evaluation for yourself. I love that advice. So Hannah, obviously you, you help a lot of people. Uh, you have an incredible blog. Tell the audience how they can find you uh, online um, and some of the, the offerings, courses, uh, and, and ways that you're helping people now and how, how can they find out about those things? So I have a site called talentedladiesclub.com. Um, if you are interested in MLM, I've written a lot of articles about it. Um, looking at, I mean, I, I, I said a lot of them, I came to it from a kind of a neutral point of view um, and just learned about it. And I looked at the facts. So I investigated a few companies, um, I looked at the industry in general. So if you are interested in MLM, there are a lot of articles about MLM on my site. Um, and yeah, and if you want advice on, how, on actually how to start a real business, or I say real business, but you know, a, a non-network marketing business. And if you wanted to go freelance, if you're looking for inspiration and advice, and what do you do courses, but there's also a lot of free, got a lot of free, they've got a free business plan template, for example. Um, it's not just paid stuff. There is free advice on there and, and free kind of, um, kind of courses and workbooks and things like that. So if you are looking to get out of network marketing or just not get into it, um, and you wanted to learn either more about it or to look at starting a business going freelance i've got resources on there for you hannah thank you again so much for being here today uh, i enjoyed both of our conversations immensely and you know the the final thing i'll say is that uh, we're not putting down network marketing we're not haters there's a lot of people out there it, it's not that we're anti or pro network marketing we're looking at this from a business perspective, a profit and loss perspective, right? Um, and, and that's, again, you if you want to do this as a business, you have to look at it and treat it like a business. And you have to, you know, it's just like any person that 
starts a brick and mortar. And sometimes you have to cut your losses. You know, I had to close my last brick and mortar because it was losing money. It just didn't make sense for me personally, professionally, emotionally, all of those things. And that's what Hannah and I want all of you to do is take a good look in the mirror and real and, and say, you know what, is this helping me or is this hurting me? And get out of your head, get into your heart. You always, the truth always lies inside of you and really lean into that truth. And again, you will see your life change. So Hannah, thank you again for being here today. Grateful for you, my friend, and looking forward to further, uh, further discussions. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me. 